thanks everybody who's um, who's tuning in uh, this evening. It's great to be with you guys again. Uh, this is turning out to be a lovely um, and very, uh, I think, helpful series. Um, so I think maybe the best thing I can do this evening, and I've kind of been requested to do this uh, too, uh, is to help sort of contextualize a little bit uh, about the specific bill that we're talking about and uh, and the specific issues that we're talking about in connection with that bill in order to um, enable everybody maybe to get a better feel for the sort of historical importance of what's being proposed here and the sense in which what's being proposed here is a kind of return to American roots rather than some sort of radical, crazy-eyed, wild-eyed, uh, newfangled uh, set of ideas. Um, so, you know, the, the founders of the United States as a country, as distinguished from a, a group of, of colonies, uh, had a particular vision, right? The vision was to establish what they called a great commercial republic, uh, and that was to be understood in distinction from a set of colonies. As a set of colonies, all that we were expected to do by the mother country uh, was to produce raw materials and unfinished goods, right? Send beaver pelts and wood and, and foodstuffs and cotton and things like that over to the mother country, and then the mother country would do all the manufacturing, all the making. Um, and so the idea then was to keep us in a position of a kind of dependence, right, forever. We were just to provide the raw materials to another country that was to do all the producing and to be the productive commercial society. That was, of course, Great Britain. The founders understood once they broke away that the only way to keep this country from sort of slipping back into a kind of de facto colonial status in everything but name or everything but sort of legal uh, status was essentially to establish the makings of an independent freestanding great commercial republic. And what that meant in turn was that it was going to be a society of productive people, a society of producers, a republic of producers. Um, and they understood, and especially their, their sort of the, the presiding genius among them, Alexander Hamilton understood, that in order to sort of establish a society of that kind, you had to do among other things, at least two sort of fundamental or basic things. One was you had to establish or provide what was called a circulating medium, i.e. a money, to enable people actually to exercise what economists subsequently came to call effective demand, right? Basically, you needed people to be able to buy the products of industry in order for industry to have the incentives to produce, to be industry, in other words, or to be industrious at all. So you needed the circulating medium on the one hand, and then you needed the basic, the fundamental capacities to do that making or producing or manufacturing on the other hand. To put a shorthand way of putting this is they understood that you need, there were certain material prerequisites to having both supply on the one hand and demand on the other in order to have a fully formed economy, a, cir a circulation economy. Uh, and so a commercial republic required a circulating medium on the one hand and the means of producing, the, 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 the sort of capacity to produce on the other. Now, the genius of Hamilton was that he provided us with both, right? He provided an architecture for both. He provided on the one hand something that could function as a circulating medium, as a money, even in a country that had very little gold or silver or specie, as they called it back then. The, one of the first uses for US Treasury security was to function as essentially a form of paper money or as the backing for other kinds of paper money. He did that on the one hand. And then he also, of course, provided for, uh, gave us effectively the first national infrastructure bank, right? The first NIB in the Bank of the US. And the Bank of the US was specifically designed to do exactly what Elfeka said it was meant to do. It was meant to help jumpstart infrastructure projects all over the country and also to assist with nascent industries uh, in this country as well. He also founded a group uh, that some of you know about or have heard about called the Society for the Promotion of Useful Manufactures. It was in a sense, the first industrial park, the first sort of industrial um, uh, sort of uh, cooperative, you might say, set in Patterson, New Jersey. And you can still to this day, you can go and visit Patterson, New Jersey and see where the waterworks were, where the mills were built. And basically the idea was to make America a kind of cutting edge technological society and productive society within the context of the late 18th and early 19th century. The program worked beautifully for, for decades, um, and it also found expression in a sense, a kind of theoretical expression in the shape that political economy took over the course of the 19th century. The political economy of the 19th century wasn't simply focused 
on demand or on basically the sort of monetary side of the economy or the effective demand side of the economy, it was also concerned with the productive side of the economy. And indeed, if you open up the opening pages of those early treatises on political economy, including Adam Smith's, they say that the whole point of political economy is to sort of get an understanding as to what it is or what, what's required for a society to become what they called opulent, i.e. productive and wealthy in a material sense, not just in a sort of paper sense. Now, what happened in the aftermath of that? Well, it, um, it's a sad story actually, but in the late 19th century, political economy was displaced by what came to be called economics. This was the so-called marginal or marginalist revolution in the 1870s. And the fundamental problem with marginalism and with most of orthodox economics ever since that period is that it's entirely lost sight, lost sight of the productive or the supply side of the economy. The marginal revolution was all about the demand side, about the utility that people derive by consuming things with no attention paid at all to how things get produced or how you have to organize institutionally in order to be productive, in order to be a sort of fecund and wealth generating sort of society. Economics basically took a wrong turn at that point. In a certain sense, it's almost as though it's been operating with a phantom limb ever since, right? We have a left arm and a right arm. You have a left brain and a right brain. Now imagine if somebody severed the corpus callosum between the two hemispheres of your brain and just tossed out one of the halves of your brain. That's in effect what economics has become. It's become half a brain because it pays absolutely no attention these days to production or to the supply side. Now, to see just how perverse that is, and this is gonna fast, fast forward us right into the moment, to the present moment, to see how perverse this is, just consider somebody like Larry Summers, right? Or a lot of other people who are following Larry Summers' cue right now. So they notice that we've got an inflation problem, right? The prices have been rising. And so what do they suggest? Well, they say, well, we've got to cut back on that demand. There's just too much demand out there. So what we need is we need at least one year with an at least 10% unemployment rate. This is exactly what Larry Summers prescribed just a few weeks ago. One year with a 10% employment, uh, unemployment rate, we need maybe two years with a 6.5% unemployment rate or five years with a five or more percent unemployment rate. In other words, we have to throw people out of work, we have to sacrifice production, we have to make people suffer, get people, more people rendered homeless, more people rendered impoverished, more people losing their health and their health insurance and health care, more people losing their educational opportunities. We basically have to just write off a huge number of people. Now, it's easy for Larry, of course, to suggest these things because he's a multimillionaire and he's also at the end of his career. He doesn't really have much, you know, much, much time left as a, as a sort of policy walk, hopefully no, no more than three seconds at this point. But in any event, it's easy for him to say things like this from a kind of individual sort of utility point of view. But if we ask what could intellectually motivate something like that, and what could motivate sort of other people to make similar uh, claims to the effect that, well, only the Fed can, can handle this. The Fed is going to have to tighten up on the money supply, tighten up on monetary policy in order to shrink aggregate demand, in order to bring those prices down. If we ask ourselves what intellectually made this possible, well, it all lies in that observation that I made a moment ago about how economics basically lost half of its brain or it's the, the phantom limb of economics problem. Because if you think about it, what is inflation? Well, it's a relation, right? Isn't it the relation between the quantity and, and, and velocity of the money supply on the one hand and the quantity of goods and services that can be purchased with that money on the other hand? In other words, you've all heard that phrase, inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. That makes it pretty clear that we're talking about a relational phenomenon here, a two-sided phenomenon. There's money and there's goods. If you have too much money chasing too few goods, that suggests that you can work from either or both sides of the equation, right? If you have too much money chasing too few goods, you can shrink the money supply, i.e. shrink the effective demand, or you can boost the goods supply, you can boost the supplies, you can boost the production. That's the other side of the equation that doesn't require that you throw a bunch of people out of work and destroy their lives and destroy their families and destroy their homes and destroy their health and destroy their environment. 
that's the side you work on if those things don't look like a good idea to you, which they apparently do look to Larry Summers. But as I've noted, or as I noticed, right, in effect, orthodox economists basically all poked out one eye, and they've, they're all basically one-eyed pirates with patches over their eye holes on the other sides of their faces. And all they can imagine is cutting back on the money supply. And you know the old saying, if all you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. Well, all they've got is monetary policy in the Fed. And so everything looks like a monetary policy problem. And therefore, the only way to deal with uh, the inflation problem is to shrink the money supply and shrink the effective demand. Now, if we repudiate that nonsense, that rubbish, if we go back to the tradition of Anglo-American or Western and then beyond Western political economy, because political economy as it was conceived in the late 18th and then early mid 19th century spread not only to the US and, and to Europe, but it also spread to Japan and other success stories. Indeed, once you get into the 20th century, the most interesting economists are no longer Western at all because the Western economists all become these kind of demand siders. Um, and the only people concerned with production and supply anymore, as far as economists or practical economic states persons are concerned, are in other countries like Japan or China or Korea or the other Asian tiger economies or many of the Latin American economies now and increasingly many of the, many of the African economies now. But in any event, the thing to do is to go back to our roots, which we can actually paradoxically see well at work in lots of other countries now that are following the Hamiltonian model, even after we've um, um, ejected it or, or, or rejected it, um, and rediscover our own productive capacities and the secret of enhancing productive capacity. And the way to do that is to go back to the Hamiltonian model, but of course to update it in 21st century form. And that's exactly what the NIB proposal uh, that Alfeca uh, elaborated for you guys a moment ago is doing. So in a sense, I'll close, I guess, by saying that in a sense, what we're talking about here then is something that on the one hand is kind of retro, but on the other hand is kind of very futuristic and very forward looking. We're basically talking about getting a head start on all of the great industries of tomorrow, the industries that are going to be earth preserving, environment preserving, good high paying quality jobs preserving, community preserving, and in the end, nation preserving. That's what we're talking about. That's both futuristic and traditional. Uh, and so it ought to have a sort of nostalgic resonance on the one hand, but a kind of shiny, exciting, new futuristic sort of resonance on the other hand. That's what we're talking about here. And we will we'll really be making history uh, in effect, not simply by repeating it, but by repeating it in a, in a sort of new and improved form. Uh, so I'll close, I'll close with that for now.